Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's really a treat and an honor, privilege and pleasure to join all of you today. Um, I was a little concerned about the title of my talk in the program versus what I wanted to speak about. So you can see I blended this uh, pithy title here. Uh, but, but in fact, it's not such a difficult mashup. Uh, when we think about all of the exciting new technologies, tools, and, and techniques that you will be spending three days focusing on, uh, one thing that should not escape your uh, attention, or at least should be in your subconscious throughout, is the real question of cost, the question of value, and how you define it. For the rest of my talk, I'll focus on the more traditional challenge, which has been on the cost of care, and a particular focus, honestly, on some of the uh, cost of drugs. But this is a parable because the exact same set of concerns and variables will come into play. And indeed, I think that you can expect to see real scrutiny on this issue uh, going forward. Uh, the uh, learning objectives are shown here. We're going to talk about some of the variables that may define value. Uh, we're going to focus on utility as it applies broadly to treatment of, of in my case, cancer. Uh, but in fact, it really uh, can be thought of even more broadly than that. And we'll look at some of the limitations and potential of uh, big data as a way of beginning to, to resolve the, the challenges. I do want to begin uh, with a little bit of background here. Some of you will take this, I think, as uh, potentially provocative. Uh, others will uh, perhaps shrug your shoulders and say, I knew that. But, but we do have to have a common language and understanding of the nature of the problem. In the United States, uh, we currently are breaking 18% of gross domestic product uh, being spent on healthcare. Let us say at the outset, that could be a very good thing. That might be the mark of a particularly healthy economy. I don't know where the tipping point is uh, where healthcare spending crowds out other kinds of, uh, of components of the GDP. You do need a society that, from an economic point of view, makes widgets that makes things, that builds wealth, that does lots of things. Uh, but it might be great if, uh, uh, on the one hand, if we were spending a lot of resources on, um, on health care. It's projected that within the next uh, five or six years, it will break 20%. And it's not clear where, where the cap really is. The problem is that across the world, it is not the case that higher spending in the context of the country's GDP necessarily translates into a crude measure of better health outcomes. So life expectancy is a crude measure. And let me say this, it's entirely possible, and I've come to believe it's likely, that this kind of averaging effect misses the point. I'm willing to, to bet that within the United States, for example, there are wide ranges of spending in various micro-environments, and in many cases, the higher spending is associated with better outcomes, whether it's life expectancy or morbidity from illness and so forth. So one size fits all across 300 plus million Americans, simply averaging the, uh, the outcomes and, and dividing that, if you will, by the GDP, probably is too crude a measure. However, if you are a broad policy wonk and your job is to just decide where you set this, you can't think that simply spending more across a society necessarily translates into better outcomes. So change is coming. And it's interesting if you hear speakers in this area talk about it from some of the architects of so-called Obamacare like Zeke Emanuel and others, they'll remind you that in 2006, 7, 8, there was bipartisan agreement that health care reform was needed in the United States. It was not the partisan issue that it has become. Of course, the shape of that health care reform is open to lots of discussion, but there really was agreement that something had to change. So whether we're for it or against it, we're changing right now. And at the same time, we, especially as health care providers, have to be very, very sensitive to the fundamental problem of access. Uh, we do not want to limit access, and at the same time, we have to be very supportive of a robust health care economy such that innovation and creativity continue to be incentivized and rewarded. Simply capping 
the cash flow and limiting the resources available for innovation would be a disaster. And I want to be specific about this. A traditional area of American leadership across the post-World War II period has been science and technology. We have achieved that because of a societal investment in that area. We've done that through many, many domains, including, of course, the NIH, but frankly, the space program and many others. When we cut investment into that sector, either in the public or private uh, side, what we're doing is threatening traditional American leadership for the long term. And so we have to be very careful about that. So cancer is a success story, the answer, the, the place where, where we work. Of course, this is a truncated y-axis, but you see the overall five-year survival for all cancers has been rising uh, really since the 1970s. This is leading to a paradoxic um, problem, which is the problem of too much success from a healthcare cost point of view. The number of people who are surviving cancer, living with cancer, being treated for cancer, is projected to increase by 45% by 2030. So whatever problems we face today with high prices are going to simply be magnified unless we uh, do something about this. The specific cost of cancer care is rising. And it's rising in a way that may not be what we want. Uh, what's plotted for you here is the increase uh, by uh, 2020 to $175 billion per year from 125 just at, uh, at the beginning of the decade. But in gold, uh, and this is broken up by disease areas, you can see that a lot of the spending is in the last months and year of life. This is not necessarily bad. This may be where you have to spend because that's where you palliate disease and suffering. But it also is possible that it's not so efficient. It's possible that spending earlier in the disease or in the prevention phase might actually yield more long-term benefits. All that this demonstrates is that we have to be very thoughtful about where we're spending money and why. The rise in, in healthcare costs is, uh, is significant. The rise in cancer costs is more significant, and indeed, the uh, rise is faster than that of the overall cost of cancer, uh, I'm sorry, overall cost of healthcare. And indeed, if you look very specifically at cancer drugs, the rate of inflation for them exceeds cancer care and exceeds total health care and dramatically exceeds that of the US economy as a whole. So it is clear that some forces are at work with regard to cancer drug pricing right now, which are uh, not helpful. Much of the pie is under the control of two portions uh, or two parts of the, of the eco economic market, if you will, and that is hospital care and physician and clinical services. And this is, of course, where a lot of testing and new technology will be apportioned. It is the physicians who decide when to write an order, when to spend money. And so ultimately, it is going to be a physician's shared responsibility to take on the challenge of delivering higher quality care while at the same time uh, controlling some of the costs. Drug prices, the topic of the 60 Minutes story last night, are an easy target. They are an important target, but let's be clear, they are actually not the only component of the rising health care uh, cost. I will, however, spend a few moments just addressing this issue because it is one that we have some control over, and it is, as I said before, it'll serve a little bit as a model for how we have to think about tests and technology in the years to come. First of all, the price. What you can see here is the monthly and median cost of cancer drugs the, from the time of their FDA approval from 1965 through last year. And as Peter Bach has written in Forbes magazine, the single best predictor of the price of a drug today is the year of its FDA approval. In a multivariate analysis, that is more important than any of the other explanations that are provided to its year of approval. And you can see that the rate of rise is dramatic. And as a, as a rough ballpark, for cancer, most of the recently approved drugs come in at about $100,000 for each year of use. So for a very successful long-term drug, this could be a big burden. Honestly, for a short-term drug given for a few weeks or months, uh, obviously the financial burden is markedly less. But it is a problem that there are artificial forces at work in this non-market that are driving this. And, and I say this with some trepidation. But in a simplistic sense, nobody cares what it cost Cadillac to develop their newest sedan. The price they get is determined by what the buyer is willing to pay. No more, no less. 
If they make the foolish mistake of spending a billion dollars to, de to develop their sedan and the market will only give them $30,000 a car, they are in trouble. In the industry right now, there is a tendency to attribute the high cost of drugs to the cost of development and pass it on as a, as a right. That's fine. We can elect as a society to take that course, but I will caution everybody that that is at its root a public utility argument. It is not a free market capitalist argument, and so we're going to have to think very carefully about what arguments we want to use to justify price. The problem is it's breaking the system. This is a projection. This will not come to be true. But if current forces were left unchecked and if nothing changed, by roughly 2030, the average American would be spending in total with them, their own contribution and that of their employer more money per year than the median family income. The lines cross right about here. And that's about $50,000 a year right now, more or less. Again, I want to be very clear and not be misunderstood. Nobody says that this will actually come to be true. It can't. It breaks the system. But it is a scary projection, and it reminds you that there are big forces at work here, and, and they need to be addressed. So one aspect of this which came, comes up a lot is the issue of copay, and this is the burden of drug costs that individual patients bear. Here's something that should come as no surprise to you whatsoever. As you increase the amount of money that the individual patient or family has to lay out to get their drugs, their compliance with the drugs goes down. This raises a fundamental question for everybody to think about. Why on earth do we have a copay structure for life-saving drugs? Who benefits is the question. So in this example, published last winter in the JCO, this is, of course, for, uh, for, for Gleevec, uh, a transformative drug for CML. Indeed, a drug which maybe in its early days was threatened with non-development because the market looks so small and is now the, one of the largest selling drugs in cancer. It's also one of the most transformative in history. It's a drug that's been singled out for attention because its pricing has changed long after it was developed and approved in a dramatic way. But what this shows is that as you raise the out-of-pocket burden for the individual patients, their compliance goes down. That's a basic economic observation. Who in the entire ecosystem benefits from a non-compliant patient? The insurer? The society? The hospital system? I can't find the answer. And yet, we maintain a system that, let's be clear, this incentivizes compliance with a life-saving drug, a drug that prevents early death, a drug that avoids expensive bone marrow transplant. This is a broken system. There is just no justification for it, and we seem to be stuck with it. To get around this and what's coming, and, and in my title of my talk, I refer to this, that others will do it for us. This is the others. So this is an early example. It came out in the week, literally, before the uh, 50th ASCO meeting. This is from an insurer in California. They are actually handing physicians a monthly fee, a stipend, for the simple act of complying with standards. I've chosen my wording very carefully because many in the physician community are angry about this. They see this as a kind of a bribe. That is, that the company is bribing the docs to choose less costly care. And you can frame it that way, and there are some elements of, of accuracy in that. But another way to describe it is that a panel of experts has identified what is, in fact, the best approach to individual problems based on evidence, and they're telling the docs, We'll reward you financially if you actually stick with what we think is best. And so now the question very quickly becomes, if that is our future, if standardization is our future, if guidelines are our future, guidance are our future, uh, guidances, if that's the case, who should be in control of that? Who should be identifying best practices? Who should be defining high quality care? And who should be promoting it? And the argument obviously is we should be doing that, not others. So in order to do that, we have to confront a couple of basic issues. This is a, a quote ascribed to Warren Buffett, although I will confess to you that when you go looking for it online, what you find is that people claim that he said it quoting somebody else. So I don't know whether he takes full credit for this. Price, the cost of the drugs, that's what we pay, of course. But value is actually what we're looking for. Value is what determines what you're willing to pay for that Cadillac, your perception of it. And so our job, if we're going to tackle costs, is actually deeper and more complicated. It is to define value. 
And to define value, we have unique challenges in, in the cancer space. It's highly emotional. There's a sense of urgency. Um, I, all of you in practice know that when somebody's diagnosed with pancreas cancer that's metastatic to the liver, they, of course, understandably, make a series of phone calls rushing to get to the fastest first appointment they can to get confirmation of the diagnosis and to initiate treatment. And I completely get that. I'm on the receiving end of it all of the time as an oncologist. On the other hand, there really is no rush to start palliative chemotherapy for, for metastatic pancreas cancer in 2014, sadly. This may change. But that kind of emotionality does drive uh, the willingness to spend whatever it takes in those first few weeks and months after a dire diagnosis. And that has a distorting effect on the sense of value in the marketplace. There is in our field tremendous pressure to use what's new and greatest, even when it's not necessarily better. And we've had a couple of chilling examples in the last few years of new technologies and new tests and new drugs that were significantly more expensive than what they sought to replace and were simply not better when finally compared through randomized trials. And that kind of example should remind us that uh, new is not always better. We have an obligation to prove it's better. The treatments that we give in cancer are expensive, and, and I've already spoken a little bit about the side effects, if you will, the toxicity, the financial toxicity that they can uh, bring. Uh, the treatments themselves are physically toxic. They have lots of side effects that are themselves expensive to manage. That drives secondary expenses. And uh, honestly, in our community, there's been a reluctance at times to appropriately switch to supportive care near the end of life rather than uh, active therapeutic care. And you saw that in the bar graph that showed you the disproportionate spending on the uh, end of life. So here's a question. Who said this? And this is a quote from Forbes magazine. It says, and I've underlined the key point, that the oncology pricing structure has to be rethought. It has reached a level that will not be sustainable. That sounds like a radical, socialist, communist claim. It sounds like something that would be coming from the far left. This is the CEO of Novartis. That's who said this. So the recognition is coming from all quarters that the current system is actually broken. And I've said this before, and it sounds funny, but my point of view is that the industry is a victim of this broken marketplace in its own way, the same as patients and physicians and healthcare providers are. What I mean by victim is it's an unnatural market that drives, in its closed system, rational pricing, but across a broader free market, irrational pricing. And they are doing, as an industry, exactly what they are incentivized to do. They are doing what any rational player would do. And if they didn't do it, their stock price would fall and the marketplace on Wall Street would punish them. So there is no criticism from me to them for their pricing. What I'm criticizing is the structure in which they work, which we all contribute to. And to fix it, it's going to take societal input, not just their volunteering to lower the price. So every stakeholder has a role. The providers, we need to think innovatively about how to control costs. We have to do some things that sometimes seem unpopular. We have to educate the patients that they are the right things. The payers, they have to figure out how to shepherd limited resources, and they have to take a longer-term view than they take sometimes. Uh, patients have to be educated even more than they are now so that they understand why we do what we do, why our recommendations are appropriate. And this comes to testing, again, the topic here. Just because you can do whole exome sequencing in 2014 for every patient with a solid tumor does not mean that there's any value in that right now. And that's a bitter pill sometimes to swallow, but it's a fact. We're in the R&D phase for a lot of that. Not at all, but for a lot of it. And who pays for that research and development is a critical question, which I will submit to you is frequently sidestepped as we talk about the tests and the billing for them. Manufacturers have to find ways to be even more efficient. The notion of an unlimited uh, open check is gone. One of the comments that comes out in the Medicare uh, addressing uh, or, or approach to drug pricing last night in 60 Minutes is something that I think many people don't really focus on. But currently, Medicare is duty bound to pay whatever the manufacturer set as the price for their drug. They can't negotiate it. And so that's an example of, of finding ways to, to, to um, to, to reset a little bit of the marketplace. 
So ASCO has taken this on in, in the last few years. We have formed a value in cancer care task force. We have met several times over the year. These are quiet meetings. They are meant to be friendly, supportive, open. We want to provide a level playing field and a kind of a neutral territory for all of the stakeholders to get together, to air their initial salvos, to then sort of come to understand that we're all in this together, and to start working towards novel uh, solutions. And it's starting to pay off. In fact, again, literally the Friday of ASCO, this piece appeared in the congressional blog, Common Ground on Cutting Costs of uh, Cancer. This is a piece authored by a member of the board of directors of ASCO, Hagab Kantarjan, who was in the 60 Minutes piece last night. But along with that was Lee Newcomer from United Healthcare, representing the insurance industry, and Newton Crenshaw from Eli Lilly, from the drug development development side. And what this shows you is that they all agree that first, we have to define value in cancer treatment. We have to come up with standard terms and definitions. And from that, we can start to reconstruct a more rational place. So what are some of the steps? Well, ASCO's efforts to lower costs and increase value are, I think, uh, worth at least paying attention to. Uh, there will be other efforts as well. But we are promoting adherence to evidence-based medicine. This is something that's really challenging. In medicine in general, there is a kind of hubris at times that the standardization uh, of procedures and practice that has raised quality and lowered cost in virtually any other examined industry is somehow not true in medicine. Now, I feel comfortable saying that when I come to Mayo Clinic, which has been a leading light in standardization since its founding, actually. That's one of the tenets of, of the clinic's approach. But it is not something that's broadly accepted across all of medicine. Many patients, many doctors believe that in the moment of the doctor-patient relationship, there is some magic that occurs, and for that one one patient that one day, the doctor somehow knows what's best. There is a truth in that. We know how to tailor the therapies, but we really do have the same benefits from standardization as any other industry. We have to teach ourselves this. We also have to generate the evidence to inform those guidelines. We have supported the Choosing Wisely campaign. We've developed a nationwide quality improvement program called Quality Oncology Practice Initiative, or COPI. Uh, and we've been working with payers to integrate our quality measures into their reimbursement decision making. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our next step computer program, CancerLink, in a moment, which is really an overall Arching approach to the fundamental problem of big data, or, or opportunities, I should say, of big data and the problem of, of uh, defining value. We are defining clinically meaningful outcomes in cancer research so that when we design clinical trials, the endpoints are actually clinically meaningful. And we're focusing on payment reform. This is a big issue, but our goal is to reward oncologists for the quality of their care they deliver, for value, and not so much for volume. And that's going to be a sea change in the long run. So this is really how you define value in a very simplistic sense. It's the perceived or real benefits divided by both the financial cost and the non-financial cost. In 2007, we established this cost of care task force, now the value task force, to try to define these challenges. We wanted to engage physicians in, in an educational process and guidance. We wanted to increase patient education, promote high value uh, decision making, and assure that there was value uh, assessment throughout care. This is the, these are the members of this uh, task force, and they're all leading lights that many of you, uh, I think, know and would respect. We have launched physician education materials. Our goal is to develop those tools that would assist oncologists dealing with patients and addressing the cost of care. We've published on this. We have uh, currently uh, initiated even a university, ASCO University webinar course, and we have uh, woven value throughout the entirety of the uh, annual ASCO meeting at this point. We've placed materials online, both for physicians and for patients. This is the booklet that we actually now offer as a download on managing the cost of cancer care for patients. And I want to be clear, you can superficially think that this is just window dressing, but the real goal is to engage patients in a deeper understanding that spending more money is not always delivering better care. The endorsement of the Choosing Wisely campaign came at the time, uh, or was perceived at the time, as controversial. How dare we say that specific testing was not useful? But again, in this room today, with you as the audience, you have to think carefully about the tools or the tests that we listed here. Simply because I can do a PET scan in a woman who had stage 2 breast cancer in 2013, 
get a negative and reassure her doesn't make that test useful, valuable, or important. And in fact, that's the kind of exam that Choosing Wisely explicitly identifies as useless. And I met with a healthcare technology company about a month ago uh, developing new imaging. And it's really quite a, a cultural gap because the engineers couldn't understand my point of view that simply knowing, in quotation marks, that the test was clean wasn't worth something. And of course, the answer is it's not worth anything because on the next day, it could no longer be clean. It's a rear view mirror that tells you that the patient did not, to that point, yet develop a detectable lesion. And of course, when there's a lesion there that you have to pursue, there's an entire uh, snowballing uh, effect on the healthcare system. And when it's all done, the news you deliver is that you have an incurable advanced cancer. So think about that when you're thinking about the development of screening tests with new technology for metastatic disease, when you're seeking to identify and diagnose conditions for which there's no curative therapy and where the therapy itself is potentially toxic. All of those aspects have to be incorporated into any discussion of value. We are sticking with this issue. In 2013, the board of directors of ASCO uh, basically laid out value as one of the key strategic initiatives for ASCO going forward and has recognized that the discussion about value requires a definition of quality and it requires a broader focus than just the cost of drugs. So we're trying to develop what's called the value framework, and this is a tool that physicians will use in the office to sit with patients to consider what's important to that patient particularly and what it's worth. So for example, two treatment options for advanced cancer, one with alopecia, hair loss, one without. Maybe they have the same survival. Maybe the one that spares hair loss costs more money. For patient A, it's not worth a penny. For patient B, that's worth a lot, not losing your hair. Being able to individualize the decisions and engage in rational discussion about that is really our goal. The tool will not work perfectly at first. It will be seen as a threat by others. But in the end, it will shine a light on this decision making, and it will help us start to make more open and rational decisions, we hope. So I want to point out that we are not going to publish rankings of better or worse treatments overall. That would be counterproductive from an innovation point of view. It would be counterproductive from, um, from even a cost containment point of view. People can game that kind of a system. Our goal is to dive deeper and actually deliver a tool that, that engages people in thoughtful discussion. Now, as I've said, all of this is contingent on quality. In order to talk about value, we have to be able to define quality. Cost is easy to measure, relatively. Quality, not so much. How do we do this? Well, the way we've done it is, again, by engaging. And starting in about 2006, ASCO has been um, expanding a program called COPE, which is a quality oncology practice initiative. We, the cancer doctor community, define what we believe represents quality hormone receptor testing, KRAS testing, whatever it is. And then we go through your charts and we figure out whether you're actually doing what we define as high quality or not. And from that, we provide feedback. And the current process, which was initially paper-based, of course, is 19th century in its technology. So it takes a long time. It's labor intensive. It's not been smooth. And yet, as you can see plotted here, the uptake is dramatic and, and rapid. And indeed, the majority of practices in the US are now participating in some form uh, or have participated in some form in COPE. Our task at the moment, and we are right in the middle of it, is to convert this to an electronic form. And that's really part of a, of a broader goal, which is to get away entirely from paper. The analogy that I use is the following. I'm not that interested all the time in having the FAA come in and tell me why my plane crashed. What I'm looking for is no plane crashes. And that's a fundamental difference in how we have historically done quality assurance versus how we should be. What we want is a system that detects mistakes before they occur and that corrects or autocorrects or steers the clinician to the right decision. What we really don't want, honestly, is a system that comes to me in 2014 and says, you know, in 2012, you missed a chance to give anti-HER2 therapy to 3% of your patients because you didn't test them. I mean, that's, a, that's not really an ideal system. Yes, I can correct from that, but the rate of correction is too slow to help the individuals. So we want something more real time. This is what we envision to do that. It's a program called Cancer Link. 
Um, and this is the uh, uh, Cancer uh, Learning Intelligence Network for Quality. The Q at the end is for quality. And the system is point of care where the patient and physician interact, the charting of data, the transformation of it, aggregation of it, analytics, followed by the derivation of trends, associations, and so forth, along with outcomes, the generation of hypotheses based upon those observations, and then perhaps alternative data sources or even prospective studies to, to look at those, in, uh, those correlations. And based upon all of that, feedback to the point of care so that clinicians could, in fact, improve their care, ultimately developing what we would call real-time clinical decision support so that in real time, even with rare diseases, clinicians would have the opportunity to learn from what the rest of their society is doing. Now, this is not revolutionary. When you go to Google and you search for a term, not only does the page get pre-populated with the likely results of your search, but look carefully in the search box. Google's guessing about what words you're searching for as it's guessing the results, right? How do they do that? They do that because they've been recording every single search since the beginning of Google, and they have pretty good probabilistic information about what you're searching for when you type the letter G. And when you add the second letter, they're narrowing their search, right? Why in medicine have we walled ourselves off from that kind of herd intelligence? And we have, make no mistake, done that. So we are getting past that finally. By 2012, a simple majority of practices in the US were, in fact, collecting and using, uh, collecting their, their information using electronic records. Again, I feel a little bit like Coles to Newcastle when I come to Mayo Clinic, a leader in this kind of information technology from the beginning of, of the modern era. But for most of the country, there's been reluctance and resistance to, to do this. The investment was high and the payoff was not so clear. But let's just talk for a minute about a concrete example. Uh, this is Vioxx. So this is the uh, story of the COX-2 inhibitor. I'm sorry for the brand name. Shoot me now. The issue is that this drug was placed on the market as a pain uh, controller. It was on the market for about 62 months before a weak but real signal in terms of cardiac events was recognized, and it was withdrawn from market. Why? Because, in fact, most of our research is done here in the pre-approval phase, and then most of our experience with the drug, of course, occurs here in the post-approval phase, but is not recorded. We rely on a voluntary system of adverse event reporting in order to collect bad news about new drugs and so forth. 97% of adults with cancer do not touch a clinical trial. Only 3% do. So we learn from exactly and no more than 3% of adults. Interestingly, it's inverted in pediatric oncology, where the convention is that children with cancer are on research studies. In adult oncology, for whatever cultural, societal reason, that's not true. What if we could have collected all of this experiential data post-approval for this drug in the months after it was approved? If the Kaiser system alone had been on board with this, it would have shortened the time to the detection of this cardiac event problem uh, to about a year or less. And in fact, if the majority of the US had been in an electronic healthcare system, some estimates are we would have found this in six weeks instead of 60 months. And so we are losing by not collecting this data. And we need to do something about that. So we're developing a so-called learning health system. This was um, incentivized by the Institute of Medicine. They've called for the development of this. We have already built a prototype with 177,000 breast cancer patients' records from multiple electronic record systems, some of them listed here, uh, brought into it. We have, from this, been able to develop um, output including long-term survival, uh, adherence to ASCO quality measures, uh, clinical decision support, all of this was built in. In the interest of time today, I can't show you this. All I can show you is that we've learned enough lessons from this to now build a formal version 1.0 of CancerLink that we hope to launch in 2015. We have demonstrated that we can add tools on, like coping measures, to an electronic system that sits above the non-communicating electronic record systems that you're all used to. We have explored the data. For example, our data set recapitulates 10 years of tamoxifen's superiority over five years. 
Think about the time and money and effort that that could have saved. We've demonstrated that we can do this across many different EMRs. That's going to be critically important considering there's no uniform standardization there. And we've been able to aggregate these records no matter what the format and, and make use of it. So what's coming? Well, we have a lot of work left to do to fully roll out CancerLink, but version 1.0 should be on your shelves by the end of 2015, if not sooner. And not only will this improve quality, which is the primary goal, but it will also make clinical trials more efficient. It will allow for post-marketing safety and surveillance. The FDA loves this idea. Think about their point of view. They can offer accelerated approval to a new drug and be confident that they will get the toxicity data from the majority of the real world experience. That gives them the courage to put the drug out there, if you will, even earlier than in the past. And that can accelerate all of the uh, learning. It also lets us see the uh, drugs in, in unstudied populations. Elderly patients with diabetes, an easy example. Uh, people with various other comorbidities who are excluded from research studies will, of course, be included in the real world uh, uh, experience and therefore can be studied. So with that, I thank you very, very much for uh, inviting me here. Uh, and I wish you uh, great uh, success. And, and, and I hope this meeting turns out to be as exciting as it looks it is. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you thank for you. that, doctor. Um, everybody, time to send in some questions if you haven't already. We've got a, a couple here on my fabulous toy that, that I will certainly start with, but um, this is a great time to send, send some in. Um, you touched on so many important issues across healthcare today. I know you were focused, obviously, on oncology, but you know, your comments around health information technology, discussions around price and value, two very different things. Um, but it, it, let's talk for a moment about why you are, and, and your institution as well, is taking a pretty critical look at pricing. Um, I think you may have been the first institution to essentially say no to a new product in a big way based on both price and the belief that the outcomes were not significantly different, right? Well, I, I touched on this, and, and I've been saying this. Uh, I'm, an, I'm not even good enough to be an amateur economist, uh, but I still like it. The thing is, this is not a functioning marketplace. And therefore, there is no clearly describable or linear relationship between the prices that are charged and the benefits that are provided. So on the one hand, a drug like Gleevec, which runs up now at about $92,000 per year, let's call it 100 for simplicity's sake, this is a transformative life-saving drug. For all I know, the drug is worth, in quotation marks, a million dollars a year. I don't know. But in the next breath, we see a drug um, that is precise, I won't name any, that's precisely the same price, that extends life by a matter of days, if it extends it at all, has more toxicity than what comes before. And in no other marketplace would the manufacturer have the courage to charge the same for it. Again, I want to be very clear about this, and it's, this is provocative. I hold them blameless. We don't live in a, in, in a socialist society where somebody told them the price. They are responding to the inputs of the existing market as it is. Mm -hmm. It is just not a functioning market in an Adam Smith kind of invisible hand, hand way. So now you come to, to the example, which has a name, Zaltrap. Uh, when the drug was provided for colon cancer, Lenny Saltz at our institution looked at it and said, well, it's twice the price. It's not been at that time directly compared to the competitor, which was Bevacizumab, but indirect comparisons suggest that it's virtually the same and that its toxicity profile is about the same. So in what planet does the second product into an existing marketplace get to double the price while delivering the same benefits? So we said it's not that it's a bad drug, and if it had been first, it would have been on the formulary, arguably. But we said there's just no particular reason to complicate our formulary with a second choice and a drug that doesn't deliver anything. Now, it is insane that our simple and rational decision was newsworthy. <laughs> Because again, you do not walk into the Hyundai dealer and offer them $200,000 for their Sonata while not buying the Mercedes S-Class for 100. 
It just doesn't make sense what goes on there, and it shouldn't be newsworthy, but it was. Well, in your conversation about value, and I'm asking you to uh, broaden the lens here a tiny bit beyond oncology, but, but I think that you'll be able to because the value conversation in medicine today is moving us away from fee-for-service. Do you think as we successfully move away from fee-for-service that we'll start getting some rationality around the pricing? Well, I, I think we will. And again, I, I think that the, that the pricers will respond to the market forces they perceive. Um, I, I actually want to say something about this. It's about even more than this. The incentives in the current system are for some degree of mediocrity. Mm. What we want is to reward real breakthroughs, transformations, and not so much reward mediocrity, meaning the third drug on the same target with the same benefit. Well, that's not necessarily helpful unless it lowers the price. So that was one part of, uh, of the issue. Um, I think that healthcare reform is going to force some of these issues. I have the same concerns as everybody else. I don't want my clinician making choices solely based on money. Mm -hmm. What I want is a model that incentivizes the highest quality care and a system that enables that to be delivered efficiently. So will we have some missteps? Will there be you know, very um, uh, high profile examples of alleged compromise for cost? Sure, but, but I do think that changing the incentives, which is what you're asking about, will drive this over time. And so then what do you think happens or what would you like to happen in that uh, sacred physician patient relationship in your kind of vision for the future? Well, well so I'll give you one uh, example of this, I think. Um, we can write all the guidelines we want, but when my patient walks in the room and says to me, the thing I fear most about my cancer treatment is going bald, I should be able to violate the guideline, to make a decision that's really right for that patient, taking into account that kind of a very specific personal value. And, and I hope that's where we end up. It's interesting, though. I, I am so pleased to hear you say that, because I often think in these conversations, the last person we think of is the patient. Yeah. And, and yet, and they do have very different values. So for instance, uh, you know, I often hear patients saying, you know, my goal is to walk my daughter down the aisle at her wedding kind of thing. What do you do, though, as a clinician, if, for instance, the patient has a very different set of priorities, or maybe, in your view, they're not even the appropriate ones from a medical perspective? Yeah, this is what makes medical oncology a very exciting, interesting, and rewarding area to practice. So I'm actually... I thought I'm, you were going to say high wire. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I'm a clinician for real, and, and Jim Engel and I were having breakfast this morning talking about this, and, and so I see real patients. So I'm living this right now. I have a young person who presented to my office with metastatic HER2-positive cancer. And for her, Which is bad. It's, it's not curable today. It's a transformed disease because of anti-HER2 therapy, but nobody can promise eradication of disease that involves the liver and the bones and so forth. That's the backdrop. The part of this, though, is that, that, that you know, sometimes the goals that a person in that situation has won't be realistic, uh, whether it's involving starting a family or certain kinds of employment and travel or whatever. And uh, it, there's no simple answer to this. The caring physician has to be engaged in a long-term dialogue with that patient, gradually helping them make peace with some compromise. And by the way, pushing in other places too. That's how we advance our field. So I've maybe given you an unsatisfying answer because there is no simple one. You have to be a sensitive clinician uh, dealing with, with patients. At the same time, I, I will tell you a different version of the story. So bevacizumab the anti-angiogenic therapy that garnered accelerated approval in the United States and then had it withdrawn. I think many of you may be familiar with the story. Very politicized, lots of components to it. But here's something interesting that happened in my world. The drugs FDA approved, I can write a prescription for it today and give it to anybody with metastatic breast cancer I wish to. If you're dealing with a high net worth uh, population or subpopulation of patients and you describe to them the known benefits of the drug and the cost, and you say, just swipe your black card and we'll give it to you, do you know how many people will actually pay for the drug? None. So all of the hoopla and hype about what insurance and third parties should be paying for goes away when the patient is forced to think for just a minute about the real cost to them. 
And I think we need just a little bit of that. Not all of it. Most people can't accept that burden. But to your question, when we put it in real terms for patients, I think that over time they will co become comfortable with the shared decision making this will require. Question from the audience. What is ASCO's position on whole exome sequencing? And does that potentially differ from the views or your role at Memo Memorial Sloan Kettering? Well, so let me start with the latter part. You know, my institution is sequencing a subset of people with advanced cancer. It's actually a critical component of our research agenda. Uh, the goal, of course, is to, um, is to generate information that will allow us to sort patients into clinical trials of targeted therapies where appropriate and to um, steer patients for whom there are standard therapies. Obviously, non-small cell lung cancer is the, the obvious example right away. Uh, in, in a clinically relevant fashion. I'm making that point because I want to highlight something. We bill and get reimbursed for those tests that are clinically useful. We provide as a research uh, tool the testing where it is not. So right now in breast cancer where I work, there is no value proven for this and we don't bill and charge for it. It's covered by research resources. I'm making this point because this is the underpinning of the question, which is who pays? And I think we have to be very honest about where it's useful and where it's not. So ASCO's position is that, of course, well, actually, let me be very honest. I don't know what ASCO's position is. I'm not sure we have a position. But we are very, very supportive of all and any research technologies that have the potential to transform care. There are clearly components of care that rely on this as a standard. Again, lung cancer is one. They're written into the guidelines at that point. But there are other components of disease where, or states of disease where the value is not yet demonstrated. And um, we, we have to support the generation of that value or recognize where it's not so useful. Doctor, we have time for one more from the audience, and I think this is an interesting one. Your views on um, crowdsourcing, herd intelligence data, can we trust it? How should we use it? Yeah, so you probably got a hint that I'm a big fan of at least knowing what it is. I, I don't know that you can necessarily trust it. Uh, look, I, I, at the risk of being provocative, if you pick the wrong crowd, you might discover that evolution's not true, and I'm a little worried <laughs> about that. So, um, so, so I think you have to always take it with a grain of salt. But there, there, you know, most of the experiments with uh, crowdsourcing um, are, are pretty positive, and they do suggest that there's wisdom in, in the crowd that at least we should be aware of when we're making our plans. Please uh, help me give a round of applause to Dr. Cliff Huddis. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.